The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Got some fun ones this morning, don't we? Yeah, okay. So a lot of times um, I take my cue from Penny in the office on whether or not the bulletin is ship shape. Uh, The cover art is usually the last to be selected uh, because I have to often sit with the readings for a while um, to pray with them and then finally ask the HQ, the homiletical question, and see if I can answer that bad boy before I select the icon or the image that hopefully will draw on both the readings and the message. Kind of comes late in the game. The process is usually a smooth one, and I can often count on hearing things like, ooh, that's a cool picture, and then Dennis in the other room saying, make sure it's in black and white, (laughs) versus this week, which went something like Penny saying, what is that? And I said, what? And she points right at the cover, and she says, that. And I said, oh, it's a, it's a sword. She goes, coming out of Jesus' mouth? I was like, yeah, no problem. She's like, oh, yeah, Nick, that will make people feel really welcome when they come to church. And then she calls Margaret from wherever Margaret was in the church, like yells, right? And Margaret comes in, and she goes, who's that? <laughs> I said, Jesus. And she goes, Jesus? Okay. We get the picture, right? Uh, Today's image of Jesus isn't nice, um, nor is his message an easy one. It kind of takes you by surprise. If it's warm and fuzzy, we are looking for, well, Jesus has news for us. Hold the fuzz and get ready as Pax would say, for a game of the floor is lava. Because Jesus says to us, I have come to bring fire. And how I wish it were already burning. This is no meek and mild Jesus who is gazing tenderly upon Jerusalem, but rather the gaze of the Lion of Judah whose kingdom is at hand. And these are words spoken preceding a kind of judgment. They are indeed words born out of prophecy. And they are words most certainly that might fall into the category of the hard sayings of Jesus, especially if you were coming to church this morning to hear stories about lambs and sparrows, pearls and mustard seeds, 
bread bakers, fish finders, or even children. But at any rate, welcome, my friends. Didn't want that to go unsaid. While Jesus' words speak of fire, and certainly we hear that word division, I want us to be clear with one another. They don't say anything about damnation. If you look closely, that word is nowhere near this story. You have to go pretty far ahead in this story, like Luke chapter 20, for that word to even appear. And that's when Jesus is warning those around him about the teachers of the law who devour the houses of the poor, who pray in their synagogues while there are children out in the street begging bread, where widows, right, they give their last might when it's each to his own. That's when Jesus talks about damnation. Surprisingly, this story has a very humble origin, and it arises out of one of our most favorite stories of Jesus himself, that of his birth, Christmas. No reminder necessary there, right? Shepherds, angels, mangers, seems rather devoid of fire and brimstone, right? Coincidentally, what is brimstone anyways? Sulfur. Got it. Chris, thank you. Writing it down. <laughs> it has that, but not prophecy, right? You remember old Simeon, don't you? This kind of all goes back to his meeting with the baby Jesus and his family in the temple that day. Upon seeing Jesus the first time, Simeon takes him in his arms and he sings, right? He sings that song that we love. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. These eyes of mine have seen the Savior whom you have prepared for all the world to see a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. And we love that song, right? Uh, we say it almost every day at evening prayer. We say it at the end of vestry meetings. We pray it at Compline. But I'm not so sure that we remember what comes after that song. In my mind's eye, I imagine Simeon like holding Jesus sort of aloft, kind of singing to him while his parents are over on the side going, what's going on? And then as Simeon is done singing to Jesus, right, he hands Jesus back to Mary. She begins to wrap him. And then he looks at her square in the eye and he says, you know, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And he is a sign, Jesus is a sign, that will be spoken against. Sense that division right there? To be a sign spoken against so that the thoughts of many The thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And he looks at Mary and he says, And a sword shall pierce your own heart too. And there it is, my friends, right in the beginning of the story. Division and a sword. The kids saw something close to this, uh, something close to Simeon's prophecy. 
uh, we went when we went to the Washington National Cathedral last week. It was in the chapel of Joseph of Arimathea. And behind the altar, there's this big fresco of Jesus being brought down from the cross and this pathway up to where the stone tomb had been hewn. And behind him was a procession. And at the very last was a woman dressed in black. And she had a golden sword pressed right against her heart. Mary, his mother. And there it is, heart and sword in the beginning, and then where some might consider, some might enter that story and say, oh, well, that's the end. Well, we know that it's not the end of the story, right? Our Lord rises, and with his rising, breaks the bonds of death. The same Lord who redeems us from sin and death is the one that continues to say to us, follow me. And I think it's in the following of him where we encounter the fire. The fire that he asks to be kindled today. And it is in following him where the operation of redemption requires a kind of surgical precision which necessitates a very, very sharp blade. While Jesus remains the Prince of Peace, woe to us if we do not recognize that the work of redemption, the long arc of salvation, right, that bends towards justice, woe to us if we think that that will not ultimately bring division. It cannot be helped. Jesus' life is a testament to that. And fire, then, is the image that's used as pertaining to God's judgment. But it's not a consuming fire, right? It's not weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not that kind of fire. It's a purifying fire. It's a refiner's fire as used to set the clay, to burn away the dross, or as the hymn says, the gold to refine. And I think we are never to forget that as he does so, as Jesus says, light that fire, he himself will be the first casualty of that division. Or as the great Easter hymn reminds us, thou within the veil hast entered, robed in flesh our great high priest. Here on earth both priest and victim in the Eucharistic feast. And so while this same kingdom is often characterized by reconciliation and forgiveness, the announcement of such a kingdom often remains and will remain divisive because living into grace, right, extending grace, giving grace, costly grace, with arms wide open and trust in the Lord requires decision. And it requires commitment. It requires us all to submit to God's rule, to a way of life, a way of thinking and being that is often not characteristic of life in 21st century America. It's just not. And all of us, having been baptized, know that through the transformation we went through, that there is a bond that has been created between us and God that is indissoluble. A bond that neither fire or sword can wholly destroy. And it's in that bond that we are to trust. When the changes and chances of this life lead us 
invariably, to face the facts. When we are found swimming against the current, living counterculturally, or being baptized by fire. I think it's upon that threshold that we are to say together, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be recreated and through us you shall renew the face of the earth.